Hi, Majid. So welcome to the Big Ideas in App Architecture podcast. It's a pleasure to have you. How are you doing today? Very good. I appreciate it, David. Thank you. Thanks for having me. First of all, I wanted to say thank you for taking the time to you know come to the sure podcast. Thanks. It's an absolute pleasure to have you. Uh, for everybody listening, Majid is actually a, a principal software engineer at uh, Red Ventures, and he's part of their data platform uh, team. They are they are doing some interesting things. So in today's episode, we are going to dive into you know Majid's career, some of the things he has worked on uh, in the past. He has worked at you know the Ubisoft, uh, the, the the company uh, that helps with gaming, a bunch of other things. Um, and it's an absolute pleasure to have you, Majid. What is uh, your current role, and what is you know Red Ventures? Absolutely. Thank you, David. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, just to give a brief introduction about Red Ventures, Red Ventures is the parent company of uh, many industry groups that includes travel, financial services, uh, media and commerce, education. And you, you may know it from brands like Cena.com, Lonely Planet, The Point Sky, Bankrates.com, CreditCards.com. And Red Ventures as a whole helps people discover and make informed decisions through a variety of different uh, <clears throat> brands that it has to provide all those information to the, to the people. Uh, my role as a principal software engineer, uh, I've been with Red Ventures for a little bit over eight years now. I've been working remotely for most of this time with, with the team. Uh, and uh, the headquarters are in Indian land, South Carolina, a suburb of uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. I go back and forth to, to Charlotte very frequently. And uh, so my role is I've been part of uh, the data platform for the first seven years of my <clears throat> tenure at Red Ventures. And in the last year, I've joined one of the verticals to help them integrate into the central data platform that we we develop with a new modification and cha- uh, changes that we have done to the to the data platform, which we'll talk about the details in a little bit. Yeah, that's brilliant. You know, I mean, that's one of the things I was really curious to kind of learn about. You know, like every business is different, and they do some interesting things. Even though we are developers and architects, you know, there are certain things that we carry that are similar. But the way we put things together is so different, right? It's like everybody's exactly. building a different engine. So I'm always curious to kind of dig into that. When you started Red Ventures, uh, been, the kind of team you were getting into, uh, was it like you had to start building everything, this data platform from the very beginning? Uh, exactly. Tell us a little bit about um, your beginnings at Red Ventures and uh, what that landscape was coming into the company. Absolutely. So uh, when I joined Red Ventures, we were building proprietary a data platform out of very basic, like data, traditional data warehousing uh, ecosystem. A very, very simple uh, you know, database, like SQL Server at the time was a, a hot database for doing analytics. And it didn't have that much data, like relatively at the time. We thought that we have big data, but like in the millions of uh, the data pieces or events, right. as we call it. Uh, but then as we grew, and Red Ventures, as the, the company, started doing some acquisitions. So they acquired CNET Media Group, they acquired Healthline, uh, Lonely Planet, the Points Guard. There are plenty of different acquisitions that they have done along the way. But with that, the amount of data that was gathered uh, through the, the ecosystem was expanding exponentially. Right. And for being able to keep up with the volume of the data that's being added, we had to revamp that data pipeline, data structure multiple times. So from like very, very traditional ecosystem of data warehousing went to now data lakes. So data mm. lakes was a hot thing in, in 2016, 2017. Yeah. Uh, so we started building building data lakes. And then <clears throat> again, like uh, the scale was something that we were not aware of. So we mm. started with building a data lake that's capable of handling a couple of hundred million events per day. And then very quickly we grew into a couple of billion events per day. So like wow. that that scalability that had to be pretty much pre-designed into the nature of the system uh, forced us to, to relook at things and making things more efficient. Like what is available in the technology, especially on the 
the data side is changing so fast. Like every day there's a new tool, new technology, new best practice of doing things yeah. uh, to the point that uh, we, we have looked at things, multiple tools, multiple times, how we can efficiently leverage each of these and different parts. As you mentioned, Spark, like Spark wasn't there years ago. And then, then it came in and the, the ease and ability that it provided with itself was much faster, easier oh, yeah. data processing, easier distributed computation for all the data teams. And on top of that, Databricks as a whole, as a vendor, is doing a phenomenal job of improving, providing more and more and more functionalities to the point that uh, we recently switched to Lakehouse, their, oh, their wow. new data warehousing offering. Yeah. Yeah, so which, what database were you on? Um, like, w what warehouse were you on? Was it Snowflake or something before? So we were, uh, after after migrating from uh, uh, SQL Server, we moved to Redshift. So we oh, were Redshift. heavy, very, very heavy on Redshift. We still have a lot of Redshift instances because yeah. of the uh, the ease of use and uh, the familiarity of the, the company with Redshift as a technology. But now we have switched in some of our verticals, we have switched to Lakehouse and Databricks offering as well. But we still have like very powerful presence of Redshift within our yeah. data warehousing. No, I agree. I think when Redshift was like a big thing in 2013, 14 and 15, you know, like they, they were exactly. one of those first people to like build SaaS ETL that did um, massive parallel processing. So you could like run a join query and it will do get everything fast. And you're like, okay, this is great. I don't have to put stuff on Spark. I don't have to manage my Spark cluster. So this makes sense. I can use it. But also, I mean, Snowflake came out and they like, they did exactly. something phenomenal, uh, uh, but I think uh, Databricks is doing something interesting with the Lakehouse as well. That I keep, I keep following. I have a bunch of friends at Lakehouse, not Lakehouse, sorry, Data, at Databricks, um, and uh, they keep, house, yeah. yeah. And every time they hit me up and they're like, "Hey, look at this! We have like a new tool that we're coming out, and this does this kind of machine learning. Now we can do LLM." <laughs> you know? Th that's true. They do like a fantastic job, and they are pushing the boundaries. Uh, all of these companies, as you mentioned, they are doing very, very interesting stuff. Redshift itself, like AWS and Redshift, they're coming up with a lot of tools and a lot of integrations with the Redshift. Uh, got introduced to uh, Redshift streaming a couple of years ago. And the first time that I saw that piece of technology, I was like, where were you been like five years ago? Like we had to build all these stuff from scratch for right. our use case that now is a single command uh, statement that it's it takes care of everything yeah so oh, this this is a very healthy competition to see like all these companies are trying to push the boundaries of what's available making it much much easier for the end user and i think i think it's the end user uh, that benefits from this uh given we adapt ourselves to to the technology and the changes to the yeah technology. and i think one one i mean i have thought about this previously is in in the this decade i will see uh and i believe that a lot more of this maturity or mature products are going to come from outside the cloud providers like one of the things that cloud providers do really well is in my opinion give infrastructure and they give compute and storage and and they put it together in a way with a bunch of abstraction that you can connect with it and start using their products but they have to they don't have that exact focus or an entire company focus on making redshift like the best redshift out there right exactly. when it comes to data breaks same thing happens you know where they are one single company focused on providing a data experience and that's what the company is doing similarly like at cockroach labs right like we we are focused on building like the best database, uh, distributed SQL database. And of course, there are other cloud-based databases that are available. But then we are, as a company are focused and that what allows us One to kind thing. of, yeah. And I think as the decade goes, you know, the same thing happened with streaming with, you know, Confluent uh, doing exactly. with Kafka, Snowflake uh, uh, is doing uh, their thing. So I feel like the, the next decade is going to be more exciting for adopters like us. Uh, especially you who are uh, trying to like put this into your data platform. Um, a question I had, Majid, I wanted to get into was, tell us a little bit about this data platform as to who uses it. Is it like an internal use or is it for your customers? Um, uh, you know, what motivates uh, the company to have a platform like that? And what are the business implications of this platform? 
absolutely. So this is uh, mostly an internal data platform that we built for uh, the verticals, the business verticals that Red Ventures operate as. Uh, so we have these different uh, business entities, but each of these are using a central data platform. This is the central data that goes into, all the data goes into, and that helps facilitating the data governance, the, the storage, the ease of distribution, and like mo monitoring operational aspect of this. Uh, it started back in the day as a click stream data pipeline. So like only like page views and who clicked on what, that sort of the very, very basic analytics that was gathered. But then there were requirements to build this uh, data pipeline faster. So instead of having like hours of latency, we, we got it to the point that we had like data available for reporting and in the dashboards within like seven minutes. So that pushed the boundaries a little bit further. And then like we wanted to have uh, reliability built into this pipeline. So we made it to the point that uh, almost 100%, 100% uh, is, is unachievable, but like uh, at least six levels of line, nine, nine point uh, four nines of reliability that we yeah. built into the system, with including like ledgers that uh, tracks everything, make sure that the data is received and persisted where it's supposed to go to the point that we no longer only receive the click stream data. Businesses started pushing operational data, insight data, revenue data, accounting data into the central pipeline because now it's become the de facto place to put data into. And uh, that pushed like all the boundaries that was originally built uh, as the intention of the data pipeline. Uh, the consumers are internal businesses. So each of these business verticals, they consume the data and then they connect it to their own uh, dashboarding, BI tools, different, right. different analytic tools that, that they leverage. And uh, the technology itself gives uh, the, like the fact that it's built in-house, it gives the flexibility to the company to adapt to the way that we want it. So uh, the, the governance data privacy is very important. So we built everything as like a, a DNA of all these things. And then uh, the nice things that we get out of it, for example, like a customer data platform. So we can build on top of it that goes into like, like, because we have a variety of brands, we can see the, the customer across all these brands. That's amazing. It's always good to know like how uh, the solution you're building is impacting the business, right? So it seems like exactly. once once you do the ETL, once you have all of this data kind of put together from all these different sources, they can be then collected uh, by different teams to come and make business decisions and make some business out drive some business outcomes. So that's really significant. I'm pretty sure this kind of happens across multiple companies at different ways. Uh, you know, folks uh, kind of get into that. So you were mentioning that you guys went from a million events to a billion events happening every day. Was it like an every day thing? Every day, yes. Yeah, it oh, was wow. It was maybe like 60 million events per day that we started to yeah. one, uh, to closer to, to 2 billion events per day. And wow. Peak, yeah. Got it. So tell us a little bit about how the transition was like for you guys to go away, go out of SQL Server. Like how did you guys start thinking about um, making the decision to like, hey, we need to move to the cloud and this makes sense. What went into the philosophy and, you know, inferring and making decisions around it? Yeah, absolutely. So cloud was uh, basically a no brainer. So like uh, Red Ventures traditionally had their own uh, data centers and like managed their own servers, but then very quickly, like with the early, in, it was 2010, 12, like they started pushing stuff into the cloud and started realizing the, uh, the, the functionality of the cloud and the ease of use. And uh, slowly, slowly we migrated all of the data centers uh, to, to the cloud. And I, if I'm not mistaken, it's been many years that the, the whole yeah. data center is deprecated and uh, it was shut down and everything is now in the cloud. We are mostly an AWS shop uh, through some of the acquisitions. We, we got uh, some of the GCP, but majority of our stuff are on AWS. Cloud has provided the ability to like the, the freedom, the, the ease of use, the agility that we want to experiment with stuff. 
uh, when we were seeing uh, data growing and SQL Server uh, was not capable of keeping up with the data, and then a, a lot of other factors went into it. With like multi-tenancy, we wanted to have like separation of data, privacy, uh, and all the, the security measures. We very quickly realized, okay, like having a single uh, like SQL Server database, even it's a it's a cluster, it's not sufficient, it's not enough. So Data Lake, uh, backed by S S3, was a, a, like a no-brainer for us that we have to go this route. Right. Then there are like tools with Spark, Databricks, and that that's when we started using Databricks and building tools around Databricks. Uh, so we built or some of our original data pipeline through Databricks as well, and Spark in particular. And then again, like it scaled so fast that we realized, okay, we are not efficient enough with some of these, and we have to revisit all of this. Right. And uh, the the company's culture is like you can think everything and you can change things fundamentally, and nothing prevents you to do that. So it uh, they really get the data team <clears throat> thinking about how we can make things faster. Is like the tool that we are using today. Spark was the best tool, and like what are the uh, other tools that are available to our uh, usage? And we started looking into AWS native solutions, and then combined everything with like a mix of Spark plus some of the, the AWS native solutions, serverless solutions to make things faster, more efficient. And uh, now we are transitioning to to the lake house with database yeah. and everything. But again, like still a combination of a lot of AWS pieces, uh, uh, ECS containers, streaming services, and then for storage and data is the lake house. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. I, I was curious, like, what did you f feel was the biggest challenge for you over the life, like to maintain and manage this platform? Um, especially in scenarios, I would say, I mean, maybe a secondary question to that is, you, we are very good, especially in the data place, platform teams I've met. We figure out a way to get the ETL done, pull all of this data into a place. But then you also have to like do education sometimes to these uh, to teams where, uh, you know, I've had this issue in the past where we had BigQuery and we put like all of this data nicely set up. And we said to our external teams or, or teams, the consuming teams, like all of this data is available. And they had no idea how to use this data. <laughs> you know? And they were like, uh, what kind of decisions can I make? Okay, can I make a pie chart? Or we would go into, so we we as the data team would also be become like an enablement education team to guide these folks uh, on how to go and start doing some data analysis on top of that. Because at least the team I work with was, was not that mature. We didn't have data, you know, advanced data analysts or data scientists. So uh, but do you do you end up in situations like that? Like, how, um, of course, not at a high level, but you can get into some details of that. So uh, I, I've been in the technology long enough to know that actually the technology is the easy part, and it's the the people aspect that it's the the most challenging part of everything. And uh, as you pointed out perfectly, David, like uh, building these new tools, building these ecosystems pipelines to get the data from somewhere to the other is relatively easy. Like from technical perspective, the technology is moving so fast and it's it becoming easier and easier every day. It's the other end of the spectrum that like now, uh, like from the business perspective, from the people who are the end users of this data, how can you get them on board with the new tools, with the new services? And uh, especially when you're dealing with a business that is, is revenue generating. The main question is, why should I get into this new tool or new system? Because yeah. uh, like the way that I had things was working. Like, what it, mm. what's in it for me? What's Correct. the value add for for the business? And uh, in 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 our uh, effort to transition, so some of the transitions that we made was drop in replacement. So, like for example one of the data lake from like the version one that we had and was like relatively slower, less scalable to the one that we had like like much, much uh, improvement in, in processing and scalability. It was a drop in replacement. So right. we made it in a way that nothing changed. Like we 
basically pulled the carpet underneath uh, the end user without them noticing. And mm. uh, that was one of the approaches. And it took a very long time to achieve that because it was very difficult, but we were not right. ready to go through the route of pushing pushing the business and like changing the business. But with our transition to Lake House and new uh, set of tools, we thought that this is a fantastic opportunity to do a fundamental change. Mm -hmm. Now we are pushing them to, this data is available to you much, much easier. You don't need to like have multiple UI, different applications to be able to interact with your data anymore. You can log into a single place have everything within your reach and explore the data. And that expands your ability to, to play with the data, come up with new queries, come up with your uh, different different tools and ways to get the data out. Yeah, And that is the selling point to get them on board. In today's world, I think data is becoming part of everyone's role. So everyone should, to some extent, be familiar with how to interact with the data, how to get their data, and how to explore with the data. And that's what we're pushing for work with. Yeah. Like basic SQL knowledge, basic understanding of how data is organized and model is basically everyone's responsibility. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I mean, we joke about this at our company, you know, uh, because we built a database completely from scratch and the language we communicate with is SQL because every college in the world is still treating SQL as a language exactly. to communicate with data. So I think it's it's very important. I think it's some basic uh, fundamentals around running SQL queries is so critical. And I think pretty much everybody should know that, um, especially with the whole push for LLMs and all the other things exactly, that are happening yeah. as well. Uh, so one of the things I was curious about from what you were saying uh, was that when you build these, the data platform, uh, right? Uh, and when you are going through scaling this, you know, all these uh, different uh, aspects, what are the source systems? So, so when you say stream, uh, is data coming from APIs or from applications or is it coming from databases or do you have Kafka streams? Um, like, tell us a little bit about what the upstream kind of looks like. All of the above to, <laughs> to, to answer. So we have, uh, so be, because majority of the properties that we, we have are uh, customer facing websites like CNET.com or uh, Bankrate.com if, if you uh, log into them. Uh, so we have a JavaScript snippet that sits on the website mm -hmm. and I click a stream data. It's start sending those data into like who is viewing what page to an API endpoint. So that is our ingestion endpoint, which is like highly reliable, scalable, yeah. uh, and like very, very available for getting that data. And then from that point on, it's off of the, the client side, everything is on the back end. We uh, interact with uh, Kafka, uh, Kafka stream. So that data is put on a Kafka stream and then it gets routed into multiple destinations depending on, uh, we've built a very, very strong self-service mechanism into place that you can route every event as we call it, every uh, quick stream data into many locations. You want it in right. data lake, lake house, you want it to participate in, like you go to Redshift directly, or like you want to send it over to external third party services like GitHub right. or like other, other external services. And these are all configurable. And then that uh, Kafka stream having multiple consumers, depending on who's sending what type of data, then they know how to interact with that data. Uh, again, along the same lines, the, the security privacy. So if they contain sensitive data, does it need to get redacted or based mm. on the, where the data goes, it like all the, the the privacy rules are being enforced on that data. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So it seems like most of your data is not batch, but more real time in that sense. More real time, all, exactly. All event driven architecture, right? So event driven, uh, exactly. Exactly. Well, wow. that's awesome. So uh, I, before we like uh, swing to, I wanted to, I would really wanted to dig into some of the cool things you did at uh, Ubisoft. But uh, one of my questions was, what do you enjoy doing the most on a day-to-day -day basis? Is it like playing, uh, setting up the infrastructure and getting data, pulling all of those pipelines, or, uh, or you know, is just like analyzing the data? What What are you passionate about? 
at least what do you incline to <laughs> <laughs> my my role uh involves multiple things so i've uh, i still i try to keep my myself hands on i still try to do a bit of coding every day yeah. uh but uh many of them it involves like system design like how do we redesign uh the the full flow of the data and what really excites me on the whole data ecosystem is the beauty of a combination of software and data so mm -hmm. there's no in my opinion there's no separation so like data pipeline to be efficient it has to be scalable reliable available so all this stuff that goes with the software engineering and they, yeah. it's it's in my opinion it's the place that they go hand in hand so you have to know a good amount of data and good amount of software to be able to uh to to be efficient but uh what really excites me as well like in in terms of uh seeing the end to end so in the past year i was involved in the other spectrum of the product that we were producing for the for the I was part of producing as uh, for the past seven years and joined one of the verticals mm -hmm. now it really helped me to see the end to end okay like, wow. wow I wish I knew like that your pain point two years ago that I could yeah. have facilitated this and this is like putting different pieces back together so that really opened my eyes into right, okay right. like yeah like just focusing on developing the best product is not sufficient so like sometimes going to the other spectrum and seeing how that product is being used is a, a very eye-opening experience yeah no i agree i think uh, i've had similar experiences where we we start doing something and we are technologists so we are like oh my god look at this i'm building something super amazing and everybody is going to love it <laughs> and then we present it to people and they're like how do i use this and uh, do you even know what i want <laughs> so uh, I think those kind of things happen all the time. But again, that's the beauty of the world we are in right now. We get the opportunity exactly. to go back to these problems and kind of improve it, right? Um, anyways, so jumping into, I mean, thank you so much. I think one of your, the last response you gave was like beautiful. You know, I, I really enjoyed getting your philosophy and perspective on um, the way you approach things, you know, in time, uh, in kind of on your day-to-day -day basis. Uh, I was really curious when I saw somebody work at Ubisoft because I've never spoken to um, somebody who uh, was part of a game that I used to play. I used to play so many games that were developed by Ubisoft, right? Uh, so uh, what were you part of that gaming division or or what, were you, what was your role? Tell the people a little bit about some fun things you did there. Absolutely. So my role at Ubisoft was uh, very similar to what, what I have today. Right. It's mostly like online backend services or what they call as live services. So uh, a, a lot of like system architecture, backend architecture, implementation, APIs, yeah. which involves in like leaderboards, matchmaking, multiplayer, uh, all those like interesting stuff that goes, like, everything, basically everything that goes over the wire uh, for multiplayer or like as a, as a group setting. And I have been fortunate enough to, to have my name as part of a, a couple of games like Assassin's yeah, yeah. Creed, Rainbow Six, uh, and like Far Cry. I worked on it a little bit. And uh, it was uh, one of the, the Connect, Xbox Connect uh, fitness game called Your Shape Fitness that uh, I Got worked it. on that project too. So you're part of, so my, one of my favorite games, uh, early 2008, 9, I don't remember if exactly, was Far Cry 2. Uh, and uh, and I, I remember I had a GPU at the time, an NVIDIA GPU. I played so much that it died on me <laughs> that I could go get a new one. Because I think it came out with like the best refresh rate and I had pumped everything up. Uh, you know, I was using my, um, you know, all, all everything that was I could push, I was pushing it. And so such a great game. Um, I also played Assassin's Creed. And so, so did you, were you like a gamer while you were there? Did you like game also? I'm just curious, you know. I, I like games. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that's basically one of the reasons that I, I joined the company because I like games. But then when I joined, I realized, okay, I'm not a gamer. Like the, the people <laughs> that I saw there was so like hardcore gamers that yeah. I considered myself, okay, I'm not a gamer at that extent. And uh, funny enough, like one of my 
recurring annual feedback every time it was their review session was like you have to play more you have to play more I was oh, like, wow. okay. <laughs> hey that's like your com- when your company encourages you to do less work and more play like <laughs> that, that's a good environment to be in yeah but i i do remember you know like far cry 2 um, assassin's creed like the first version i really enjoyed it and after a while i felt it's pretty redundant in the sense the same kind of an approach but ubisoft did some really cool uh, games actually and even still even now they're doing it uh, what was interesting for me when you said matchmaking and things like that when you go and talk about matchmaking and you talk about multiplayer experience uh, a lot has changed in the last decade uh, you know yes. in gaming especially like for example with the um, with a game like call of duty um, multiplayer or Fortnite, you know these are like you have to do matchmaking and one of the interesting things to solve is even if you're playing fifa i don't know if you've gone into fifa you have to start playing the game and I want to play this game multiplayer with somebody else. I want the game to connect me with somebody who is in US, right? Or in my region, not to somebody who's in Europe or um, say Australia, because then it's going to add lag. Uh, and when you're programming these games and you're making this matchmaking uh, systems, you have to consider all those things, right? Uh, so um, was and my my question to you was when you were part of the team of working all all those things, and this was way before where we are with uh, e gaming or multiplayer games. What kind of problems were uh, you kind of coming across? So there is like in the gaming industry, uh, there are a couple of challenges which are not uh, experienced outside of the game. Mm. Uh, in my opinion, like one of them is deadlines so the deadlines are actually deadline there is a huge marketing campaign going for uh, a specific game and it has to be ready by that time wow. otherwise it's going to be a, a, a big hit uh, for the company not to release a game on a, on a on a date and with all the the process things may not have changed or may have changed since i uh, was at the, the gaming industry but the, the process that you go and submit a game to uh, the first party services and like the audition that it has to go, it takes time. So like it has to be ready by a certain date to be able to release it for uh, the date that the marketing campaign has pumped. So those are very tricky. And then your client is, is fixed. Your code sh- is shipped within a disk or within now it's downloadable, but like the, the nature of the code is fixed. So you cannot, mm-hmm have the ability like a, a web application that you go and change something on the client side relatively easily. Uh, that makes it restricting, but also interesting in terms of the challenges. So yeah. that's one of the, the times that, for example, like, again, like I have not been part of the gaming industry since 2015 when I joined Red Ventures, but uh, prior to that, it was the, the inability to change the client side or it's so expensive that sometimes doesn't worth it because you have to go through like a, a DLC process that uh, it was at the time that MongoDB is a, like a NoSQL document database was, yeah. was rising. And we leveraged that in a very beautiful way with the combination of traditional relational databases to be able to extend the functionality of the game. So like mm-hmm. one type of data is coming in from the old version of the game with these fixed schemas. And now like we want the data to be in the same place for competitions, for like matchmaking. And now MongoDB as a NoSQL database at the time really helped us to get there with nice. like a, yeah. a hybrid solution of the databases. It's very interesting. Um, how sure, do you, yeah. Uh, yeah, how do you keep up with all the you know changes to technology uh what's your discipline around hey there's something new going on i need to go check it out and learn and keep up with this because i mean i was i was i got the opportunity to speak to some uh folks the other day and i was telling them that when i was in college i would learn something in my first year and by the time i i'm finishing college that thing is old this is a four-year time frame um and then somewhere in the uh, last five six years uh, you you learn something maybe in two years it's old but now everything is changed like every six months uh, there is There's something, something getting yeah. obsolete yeah so exactly. how do you, how do you how do you go about all of that Majid? Uh so the, you, you have a perfect point uh, I think I think the the 
the speed that the technology changes, it's so fast that it's not even getting to the to the books. So like previously we, we got a book and you read the book and that's how you keep up with the technology. But now it's, yeah. it's changing so fast that the whole cycle of writing and publishing a book and printing out and distributing is so slow that by the time it's out, it might be like uh, like deprecated or so some parts of it might be deprecated oh 100 uh, yeah. that's 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 one part of it uh, but then uh the other is now the tools especially like cloud provides you the ability to play around with the new technology very quickly uh so the hands-on like experiment with a new tool, a new service is significant. So mm -hmm. if a new database has come out, if a new technology has come up, you can just like spin up AWS, for example, provides a lot of free credits for people or Databricks does a lot of like single cluster free that you can, you can leverage. And those are the opportunities to, to play around. Yeah. And uh, playing is something. What we usually do is we try to do uh, first of all, like keep ourselves up to date with technology, like what's out there, what's available. Uh, because in my opinion, like software engineering is like you have a, a toolbox and all of these technologies are different tools within your toolbox. You do it. Right. You just need to, you just need to know that you have this particular tool available. Yeah. Like how it works, it doesn't really matter, but like what problem it solves is the most important thing. When the time comes for you to, to use that tool, you will go and learn the details and nitty gritty of that particular tool. But the fact that it exists, right? As an example, like graph databases, we mm -hmm. know that what is a graph database, what problem, what kind of problem it solves. It's, it's sufficient that like when you see, for example, like uh, uh, an identity graph, you realize, okay, this could be a good potential for a graph database because oh, you're yeah. shaping a, you're shaping an identity graph. So like that, that type of approach. And then, uh, doing a small proof of concept, a POC within the service, time box, like, yeah, I want to dedicate, I don't know, a week, two weeks uh, time frame for this particular technology to see how it performs and behaves compared to what we already have. And that gives us a very good uh, understanding of like evaluation of the technology and basically being open-minded that, yeah, yeah. Like, just because something is shiny new tool, it doesn't necessarily mean to be the best. Exactly, uh, so. yeah. Like we, we, we need to evaluate it. And one thing, although the technology is changing very, very fast, but the basics and the fun, fundamentals are consistent. So the, the fundamentals yeah. of like computer science, distributed uh, computing, all those are like, they stay the same. Yes, the, the high level abstraction changes, but uh, the underneath and the, like at the core, they stay the same. Yeah, that's well said, actually, for anybody who's listening, this is Majid's routine to keep up with what's going on. So if you are trying to figure out how to do the same thing, this is sound advice. So <laughs> spoke like a true, uh, you know, truly experienced, uh, uh, you know, person uh, here, Majid. Uh, I just for wanted sure. to say uh, for people who are listening, if they want to follow you, do you put something together? Do you write or uh, they can, uh, are you active on LinkedIn? Uh, where do uh, people get to see all the awesomeness? I appreciate it, David. Thank you. That's very kind of you. <laughs> yes, I do have a, a personal blog, MejidFN.com. And uh, this is also my Twitter handle, or X as we call it today, MejidFN. And I'm also available on the LinkedIn. Very cool. I believe uh, if anybody wants to talk to you real time, then that's probably X uh or linkedin and then blogs where you uh, get to write uh, stuff but you know majid i wanted to say this was such an absolutely fun conversation to uh, get into with you you know you you've been an absolute awesome guest to be on uh, be here uh, with on the big ideas in app architecture podcast uh, thank you so much for speaking so candidly and i hope you had uh, a lot of fun um, doing this podcast i appreciate it baby. thank you I really appreciate having me and it was a pleasure talking to you too all right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. And uh, we'll catch you in the next one. All right.